Thank you. So this is a relatively short talk. It was supposed to be a little bit longer, but I've, I've cut away some things. So I might not talk, actually talk about all the things that were in the description, but hopefully most of them. Uh, so uh, I won't talk about testing because it's, everybody talks about testing and you should already have tests. And <laughs> <laughs> so if you, and if you don't have any tests, you can't refactor. And if you can't refactor, you can't make your code better. So, so I'm just going to assume that you have them. And if you don't, you should have them. <clears throat> so this will be just a few random topics uh, and like from my experience. And it's sort of things that have worked for me. They might not work for, for everyone, but <clears throat> almost all of them are like based on experience and not something I read. They, so hopefully there's something interesting for someone. Uh, so let's start with some, some random tips here. This is the first one. This you probably maybe have heard of this one. It's a classic. Uh, you can find it in the book, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know by Kevin Henney. Uh, it's kind of an obvious thing. Uh, the reason I bring it up is because uh, I think that in sort of in uh, light of today's the way people work today and you have scrum you have sprints and you have like very small dedicated things to do and then you have code reviews I think people are very re reluctant to do things like this they will they don't want to put anything in the code review that people might sort of not accept so I think this should be encouraged more and maybe even if you have a really bad code base maybe you should have it like a mandatory thing sort of Everybody do your thing, but you always still have to fix something else in some other part of the code. So this is actually not something I have experience with. It's just something I think we should do. Uh, this one is something I've used quite a lot recently, actually. Uh, it's kind of a simple thing. Uh, if you know this uh, mutation testing, some of you might know it. It's uh, when <coughs> you have automated tests that sort of change your code and make sure that your tests actually fail when you change code. But if you don't have this, you can just do what I do. Before I refactor something, uh, I just make some minor changes to the, to the code, part of the code I want to change, and I make sure that the tests actually fail. Uh, and actually, this has worked pretty well. I, I'm, I'm thinking of, it would be nice to have some tooling where, which lets you just sort of perform a, a bunch of small changes and uh, just uh, sort of start uh, in parallel a bunch of unit tests and make sure that if the test actually succeed, you will get a report back with a diff saying like, this change that you did actually did not trigger. And then you know, like, then you have to write tests to trigger it before you refactor and then you can refactor. So th this actually has been working. Also, uh, the reason I have this here is, I mean, this is also something you've heard, you should not do it prematurely, but you should also design so you don't unnecessarily pessimize stuff beforehand. But uh, I also think that you should actually actively sort of not optimize the low-level stuff, mostly because it's such a like fun thing to do. And it's, if you have a sort of localized part of the code that is well tested and have a good interface, I mean, probably you never need to optimize it. But if you do, it's really nice to have like for kind of a new employee that you really want to make stay in the company because he's going to have a good time doing it or you can do it sometime when you have when it's boring because I mean at least if they're like me they really enjoy doing that stuff uh, uh, complexity so I won't I won't speak anything about how to avoid it or why it's bad I mean or maybe a little bit but uh, if you want to learn about that you should listen to any of Kate Gregory's talks they're on YouTube uh, so I just want to show you kind of how I think about complexity through this post-it note here. So this is sort of, yeah, you have work on that axis and complexity on that axis, and you want to get to version one done before you hit the breaking point, which is kind of the, the place where, you know, the product failed, basically, you give it up. And so like this first line, this is kind of me when I started coding. I wanted to make some game on the Commodore 64 or something. I, Managed to get to the title screen, maybe, or like the character creation part of an RPG, and then it was just a mess, and I just had to give it up. And the second line is kind of like many products are, I think, that you sort of, you, the product gets more and more complex, but you try to fight it. You maybe put in more people, and sort of, uh, you try to sort of, everything just converges on this uh, point there. You should try to get to like this version one or whatever before it's just too messy. 
And like this third line there is where you want to be. This is when you have a good test and you can refactor and you can just, you know, it requires a lot less people and it's just great, <laughs> great if it can be done there. So that's kind of, and you know, the, this, the angle of this done line here, first, at first I draw it vertical, but then I realized, I mean, of course it's, the more complex the code is, the more work you have to put in to get there. So, and I think it's probably, in reality, it's probably more like even, the angle is even more, more than that. And also this, this uh, breaking point here is not really always obvious, especially when you, sometimes it's sort of, you don't really know why things doesn't really progress and why things are not moving forward. And then you have to think about maybe something needs to be refactored. Maybe it's, maybe something's too complex. Uh, so code quality, a bit more in general, or how to improve it. This is, I think part of the description was contained this crashes are great, but I mean, what I want to say is crashes are good. Exceptions are, of course, better. And silent errors is what you really don't want to have. So my kind of main point here is like if, if, you, if things can break, you want them to break and you want them to break preferably for you, but as soon as possible and preferably also like loudly. Uh, I found it like if you try to uh, sort of log your, your problems instead, maybe catch the exceptions and log it or even just show a dialogue to the user saying like this went wrong and then things tend to not get fixed as quickly as if it actually have a crash or an exception and uh, then the user will report it and you will have a stack trace and you might be embarrassed and you will fix it much faster. So of course this depends on the domain you're working in but if you have the possibility to sort of allow your builds to break for the users, if you have a beta phase or whatever, you you should, because it just, at least this has worked for me, the, the code quality improves quicker because people sort of forget, even if you have a, like a known problem and everyone else, but if it's not critical, sometimes people just don't fix it because you can get around it and then you forget about it and then no one fixes it. Uh, so then we have this little picture you've probably seen. Uh, it's supposed to be funny. Uh, <laughs> The point here is that I think is, of course, it's the other way around. There are always bugs. If you find them, you can fix them. If you don't find them, you're gonna. So this is also something I noticed, maybe a difference between more junior developers, uh, that they try to avoid problems and bugs and sort of, if they, maybe they make a change and something breaks, they change it back or, uh, whereas a more senior programmer will sort of, ah, I actually exposed the problem here, now I can fix it. Uh, and this is something, it's really good to actively sort of recognize that feeling like, uh, oh, I try to avoid this for some reason, oh, maybe it's because it will break, then I should actually go that way. Like if you, you have not set up your build environment correctly, so you don't, you're reluctant to try to build this project and you should, you should try because it will fail probably, but then you might add to the documentation or you will learn something or you might even sort of add to the build script to fix it automatically and you will, or it's, uh, if you have a test case that you also think that this test, this integration test will never be able to work now because I don't have the infrastructure, just, yeah, just press, press F5 or however you do it and you will see and you will learn. Uh, yeah, so I promised some Stories, I don't, it's kind of hard when it's that so long time has passed to sort of remember what the kind of things that actually took place. And this is a long time ago and some people will recognize this. Uh, this is from, this is me. And I have no idea how the code actually looked, but it was something like this. I think. <laughs> so this was in a product where we, I don't remember if we did not have any dynamic allocations to start with or if this was kind of a special thing for that we needed some extra allocation. And it was like, uh, for, we only need like four allocations max, because it was like, you need to allocate the level and you know, like the graphics and the data or something. So we only showed like 10, it's always gonna be enough. So you don't have to check. Of course, after a while, this limit was passed and it crashed. And you know, at this point, I don't know if it's the first time I had left the product or not, but then I got a call and people were wondering. And then, of course, this happened again and again. 
uh, and I don't think people actually added any check to it because it's like, well, 100 is going to be enough, right? Or 1,000 is going to be enough. And I think, where did it, where did it end up? Uh. <laughs> so I guess it's kind of a failure of imagination. Uh, same project, we had tended to have kind of a sort of you owned your the CPP file you were working on, and if the crash happened there, that was your fault. And you also had this kind of orange cone that you sometimes have to put on your head. <laughs> so sometimes stuff like this happened when we had a particularly nasty bug that went around. <laughs> You sort of you want to make sure that you were not the guy, so you did this. Uh, so it crashed somewhere else at least. Uh, is this a later thing? This was actually not C plus uh, plus. This is more of this is not kind of a scary story. It's just sort of when you have bad code, sometimes you have to do silly things. This was, you know, we have a global list of scores that is just dependent on everywhere, and the order is assumed to be a certain way, and then suddenly you have to sort it a different way. And so the only place you can safely do it is just before rendering, because if you, you can't really cache it, you, know, you don't know who changes it, or who reads it, or when. So you have to take the, the performance hit and just do this every frame, or whatever. Uh, okay, so I have, yeah, I have, uh, we're going pretty faster. Uh, I have one recent uh, thing here. This is yeah, from current product. This is, I should say, this is not from, this is from third party code. It's not, in, not anyone I work with who has, who's written this. Um, this is just a lesson in how to not do certain things. So you have a log error function, classic number and string. And in uh, debug, you print a string. And you only evaluate it in debug because it might be an expensive thing. Error string, you can, might, might be some kind of string formatting going on there. So the macro only evaluates our string in debug. Uh, but then you also rely on that the macro doesn't evaluate our string, and you do things like this. Uh, you create variables that exist only in debug, but you use them even outside debug because the error will not trigger. So this is OK until you, well, it's not OK, but then you also make sure that the debug build breaks, so you can't really build the debug anymore. Uh, and that means that if you sort of want to, um, in release mode, also log text and see these error messages, it doesn't work because you get all these error messages everywhere that people have. Because debug is now not defined. So error message is not a variable anymore. Uh, and you have to find, either find all these places and fix it or you know, try to get debug build working again. Uh, so in Conclusion, well, you need tests for everything, uh, obvious thing. Uh, and it's this also that you should sort of go towards, if you see a problem, you should go toward it. You should sort of try to expose it, not avoid it. And it's kind of a hard thing to do, but it helps. And yes, make errors noticeable. Like, make sure you, <laughs> you should throw exceptions if you have a problem, which you, you should, you know, Make sure that they don't get lost. Like you've seen so many Java code where you just catch and log and nothing will ever be fixed. Uh, okay, that was my short presentation. <laughs>